On today's Wall Street Wildlife, we talk about the six skills of stock picking, the inexorable rise of renewables, and we're also going to touch on in inflation and capitalism. Today is Monday, the 26th of August. Badger, you went mucking about, <laughs> as is your way. You, you, you could not sit still, so you got yourself to a castle, rumor has it did uh well so like we definitely need to open our intro with like some wild adventure you've had maybe next week but yes let me set a new bar for you if you've seen the movie Saltburn, i spent friday in my underwear running around a castle with a couple of buddies singing uh, murder on the dance floor at the top of our voices from the battlements at my buddy's at my buddy's castle just out in the outskirts of edinburgh we went out for the edinburgh festival as we do every august superb fun Right. There's a phrase you rarely hear. My Running around in my buddy's castle. And dear listeners, for what it's worth, Luke is literally, was literally running around the castle. And I will, I will confess that this is the, the, the main difference between Luke and myself. He runs around castles over the weekend and my highlight is getting a haircut. So... <laughs> Uh, this is what you get when you're when you retire early via your investing prowess versus you still know, being, yeah. no one would know you never get that hat off you've got some succession of hats I'm not convinced you actually have any like do you open it it's just like a brain pan open <laughs> with the air breathing in like bearish thoughts about the world touching straight into the cranium it's a jungle in there yeah <laughs> 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 Okay, so you're back from the castle, you survived, you listened to music, let's talk investing. Before we get to our docket, I've, uh, I re-listened to episode 41 and your very persuasive arguments about coherence biosciences, and I bought me some options. I've got a synthetic along. I've jumped on board, Christoph. Have I made a mistake? Oh, man. I, I don't know how to feel about that. Um, I, I feel mostly good. You know what I'm generally curious is that do you have a, a specific part of that long pitch that I gave that made you enthusiastic enough? It just seems like they might, like super high risk. I do still continue to hold the view. They're more likely to fail than succeed. But I think I buy your arguments about the sort of deep value. You didn't use those words in the chat last week, but you called out like a couple of elements of the thesis where essentially they're priced right now for absolute disaster. And there's a, just a ton of upside. So even if I didn't really do my, as we say in the UK, back of a fag packet, basically, you know, my little scribbling uh, estimate of value, but it seemed clear to me that there's at least a 5x return in, in this company over a reasonable time frame, given moderate, reasonable assumptions about growth. And so then if that's true, I only need them to succeed, well, a little bit more than one out of five times. And that doesn't seem out of the question. So screw it. Anyway, I only bought like like a teaser bet, like 50 contracts of, in fact, it's my birthday as well. So I noted that, um, that the January 2026 calls, so that falls pretty much on my birthday within a couple of days. So I thought I'd bring some Luke Badger birthday magic to your, uh, your own investment thesis, and let's see if we can go to the moon together. Right, excellent. I, I hope those are, those are printing big bucks by the time uh, you gain some extra gray hairs. I, we won't make this into a coherent segment, but there's one tiny little thing I, I got a nitpick with you about, and this is very common in the biotech sector. You said like, you know, the likelihood of failure is still high. Yep. I disagree, and here's why. This is what, it's a nuanced take. Even though the company is tiny, or rather, because the company is tiny, that is the way in which you could be right, because all tiny companies just blow in the wind more. However, most biotechs that fail as investments are pre-revenue. They're, they fail because they have a great idea and they just never make it. They run out of money, blah, blah, blah. Coherus is revenue generating already. They pass the hard stuff. So now it's a question of how quickly they grow. That puts them much more in the category of any other business that it's just a question of how much, how soon, and valuation. And as you said, because the valuation is basically counting nothing, 
the fact that they're growing revenues, I don't think the phrase likely to fail is accurate in this case. It's just how good of an investment will it be in terms of returns. That's all. Sure. To what to a badger's conservative badgery eye, it looks highly risky and highly speculative, for sure. I'm on board anyway. Okay. And look, all right. I, I, set I, my own, I set my own expectations. Yeah. If I go into an investment like this, as I have done in the past with other companies, and I'm going into it saying, like, actually, I expect this to blow up, right, and go to zero. Anything that doesn't involve going to zero is a win, right? So, um, you know, I'm managing my own expectations from the start. Well, that's the secret to life too, isn't it? Yeah. You know, as I always say, if it wasn't for disappointment, I wouldn't have any appointment. <laughs> well, this might be a nice segue to our actual first docketed conversation, which is the six skills of stock picking. And we have plagiarized these entirely from the excellent Ian Cassell on X and various other platforms. And Ian mm -hmm. uh, is a leading light in micro cap club. I think for, for decades now, he's been identifying the tiniest of tiny, speculative, interesting micro cap companies and identifying great opportunities to make bets a little bit like the Coherence bet we're just talking about. And Ian did a, quite an interesting presentation that I saw that he's published for free on his ex. We'll drop a link to it, actually. It's worth a watch. And it was quite an unusual video. Like the first three quarters of it was all about martial arts and uh, the gentlemanly art of combat. But he does then pivot into what he sees as being the six skills of investing. And I think it's worth dipping into these and, and picking out a few comments for our listeners because there's some good stuff in here. Yes. You know, what was inspiring about that is that the, the guy talking about the martial arts guy is the world's best jujitsu coach who yeah. uh, I've seen here in Central Market with his, he walks around with a fanny pack, but the guy is absolutely dead serious. I mean, he's sort of like, <laughs> he's a New Zealander with this, like, uh, when he talks, it's like a, a pre-made lecture. He's very analytical. He, was, he used to be a philosophy. He was a graduate student in philosophy and you know, switched his talents over to the martial arts. What was inspiring to me is that when you're talking about something that has so many moving pieces and so much complexity, it's amazing the difference between the people that take their art seriously and treat it as like a life's mission to get better and then everybody else. And he right. talks about that, right? The difference between, you know, jiu-jitsu hobbyists and world-class athletes. And I think you could take the same approach to investing yeah. and ask yourself, what would it take for me to become world-class? And he identified these six skills. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a key part of the analogy as well. Like you can be a successful investor without any of these skills really, but that's by like passive index tracking, dollar cost averaging, keeping it real simple. If you want to be like Ian investing in micro cap companies or like Christoph and myself and many other individual investors investing in small to medium to large to mega cap companies. Well, you, you need some skills which you can practice and develop and uh, you need to employ those regularly, like build your experience, earn your knocks and earn your bruises. And, um, and then you too could be running around your own castle perhaps one day in 20 or 30 years time. Should we go through the uh, the six skills? Let's do it. Let's do it. So, um, and I think the first one is something you're very good at, uh, which is identifying actionable ideas. And Ian essentially breaks this down as finding ideas before others by knowing what to look for, using lots of different methods for generating ideas, like screeners doing research, networking, just observing the world, and and that it crucially, I think. You could be a great at this skill. You could be great at identifying actionable ideas, but you could still be a terrible investor. This is really just like the starting point to find value perhaps where others have overlooked it. And yeah, you've done that a couple of times with um, with some really interesting socks that you were probably one of the first people on X to start talking about in any meaningful sort of way. Where do you get your ideas? Yeah, well, I'll tell you this. This, is, this part of investing is what makes it a lifelong journey for me. And I've said this many times, I feel like as long as I'm learning something, I'm interested. And you can't be, be a good investor if you're not learning about how the world works. And so, you know, I'm, I try to spend most of my days reading and figuring out 
how things go. And this feeds my natural curiosity. And I would say, I mean, I think the guys mentioned it in the talk, right? Good investors are naturally curious in all kinds of ways, not just generating ideas, but uh, continuing to learn and, you know, working with their biases and stuff. But your question was, how do I find ideas? I think I sort of answered that by when you read a bunch and you try to stay open about the world, new ideas just flow in. But also, and this is big, uh, I try to curate the people that I trust and I listen more. My ears just always, you know, they, they widen a bit anytime. For example, you say something about a company that is on your radar, that certainly gets to the top, top of my to investigate pile much more quickly than anybody else. Why? Because we have a long-standing relationship. I trust you. You're a professional. You know what you're talking about, and the idea may or may not work out. But the fact that you have your eyes on it is counts for a tremendous amount. And I think this is the value of, uh, in a way, our podcast, right? Yeah, definitely. Podcasts are definitely one source I use. I read, read. I can read. You might be surprised to know I can read words, but um, I also write them sometimes. Uh, but I mostly absorb the knowledge through talking to people and watching YouTube and listening to podcasts. And I suppose I get my ideas from doing that, like observing the world and trying to figure out, for me, because I'm, I'm always trying to look like 10, 20 years ahead. So I'm trying to figure out, like, what are the questions that are just challenging for the world? What are the problems we have? And then just trying to figure out who's got the, probably the best solution to that or the, the germ of the best solution. And that's kind of broadly where I get my ideas from. I've got, when we talk about uh, the climate a bit later in today's episode, like I did that, I think really well, found an interesting company and it turned out to be a shit investment. But anyway, we'll, we'll loop back to that later. I'll bellyache of maybe about this, maybe a little later during one of the alternate categories. But I will say that had I stayed invested in all the companies I had found early, <laughs> I would have had seven castles. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, anyway, Ian then goes on to say, I think, I believe he has it as his second skill is valuation. So once you've identified one of these actionable ideas, you need to work out, like, is it fairly valued? Maybe we can, we could also link it back to the Coherence conversation just a few minutes ago, um, like potentially high risk, but potentially there's deep value there if the thesis plays out in the right way. We could argue about how speculative or how risky it is, but, you know, it's certainly riskier than like an Apple or a Google doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad investment. It just means that you want to have it at such a material discount to the value it could be at if the thesis plays out to your reasonable to optimistic expectations that you make a shit ton of cash and that compensates you for the risk that you took. Because maybe you have to make three or four of those bets for one of them to pay off. And hopefully that one covers the losses on the others to some massive extent. This is, I think, the trickiest one out of all of them. You need math to some extent. You're trying to predict the future of the business. There's sayings that the great businesses are usually very expensive. So sometimes trimming based on valuation reasons backfires or looking for good valuations backfires because those are known as value traps. I, I suppose I'm just sort of thinking this on the fly a little bit. I'm really not a fan of analysts or services that set price targets that say, oh, you know, this is, this is, we think this is fairly valued at a hundred bucks. It's currently valued at say 50 bucks. So strong buy, go buy it. And when you hit your price target of a hundred dollars, they will probably tell you to sell it or trim it or underweight it then. But that stuff doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. And I think you see, you see a lot of folk out there putting a ton of sweat and effort into building like discounted cash flow models where they're looking at all the different goods and services and the cost base of the company and building these really phenomenally complex models. And I think you probably, you build a wood which stops you seeing the trees to some extent, like you make what could be quite, not simple, but you could take uh, more of a perhaps a decision that's better made as a more of an intuitive decision once you've got the experience and you turn it into like a math puzzle, which gives you potentially an answer that feels so precise, you have too much confidence then in the outcome. And then perhaps you end up making a bad investing decision by either saying, oh, it's too expensive, therefore I won't buy it. And it might have actually still been a great investment to make. Or the other side, you say it's so undervalued, I'm going to 
massively overweight into it. And you know, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do given the, the risk level. I think I disagree with you to some extent and agree with a bunch of other stuff. I agree that the precision aspect in, in a lot of models leads people astray because the moment one of those assumptions is off by a little bit, the whole thing's out the window, right? So keep it simple, stupid usually works better than, than the obverse. I think what I disagree with a little bit, or maybe a lot, though, as I think about saying this, I realize it's all dependent on the specific nature of the company, that there is no general statement like this. So that's a big caveat. But one ought to have, if not a precise target in mind, that you become dogmatic about some sense of the assets are worth this much, the revenue is worth this much, and we could predict that relatively conservatively, and the call it market cap or valuation is way below or is priced way higher, and therefore there's either a lot of margin of safety or little margin of safety based on those assumptions. So to have some sense, ballparkish, if you will, of what that gap is, I think is this goes back to old school investors like Benjamin Graham and, you know, margin of safety stuff and like a lot of calculating. So I agree ultimately that uh, don't get, here's how I would say this. Don't get so caught up that your math is correct, that you become dogmatic, but don't not have some idea about a gap. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a good refinement. I think, I, I think we're broadly saying the same thing, but I prefer your, the way you said it. If you don't have the decades and, and the war stories and the, the cuts and bruises, you probably do need more of a, a strict framework to build an investment thesis around. So you're right. Uh, and it's helpful for anybody. It's helpful for anybody to have, as you said, at least a sense of what the fair value of something is. And you know what? Uh, recent example, recent example of this should be so obvious. In hindsight, everything is obvious. But I was a major shareholder of Cloudflare, hmm. which uh, ticker symbol NET. I loved everything about the company. I, I did all the research. And then if you remember, during the post-COVID, everything's going online mania, there's some point at which Cloudflare be, became valued at multiples that were absolutely astronomical. In hindsight, it's so obvious that it doesn't matter if this would, this business was actually printing gold bars. <laughs> it, it was not the it was the the value the the how expensive it was could not be justified no matter what, and and ought to have been sold. But of course, in reality, you get caught up in like things going up all the time, <laughs> every day, right? Uh, it's one. It's a painful lesson, but I wouldn't need to have done exact math or gotten an exact price target right to have known in general it was way too expensive, no matter what. Yeah, here's a here's a quick extract that I posted from my own Cloudflare holding. I think I tweeted this um, when I did my 50 day review on X a couple of months ago. I love you called out Cloudflare because I felt like a super smart guy with this one because as you can see on this pretty picture, like the green blobs are buys and the red blobs are sells. Like I've kind of traded this one a little bit and you're exactly right. I think it was like November, 2021. I was in love with the company. I was actually using their services. I had Cloudflare deployed on one of my websites. I thought it was great, but it was just wildly expensive. It was like over a hundred times sales. It was like something crazy. And uh, I, I did a fairly material trim of like more than half of my holding just before it took a massive nosedive. So um, yeah, like no matter how much you believe in a thesis, as you say, right, unless the company's literally got like maybe a warehouse of Aladdin's lamps and genies, like there's a there's a limit to its ability to generate real earnings and shareholder value. Yeah, I, I, I would say even more explicitly that even if they have a bunch <laughs> of Aladdin genies and gold bars, there's still a price that's too expensive. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so valuation yeah. as a skill never really goes away. You only get three wishes from the genie. Like, what would your uh, wishes be? Any ideas? And you can't wish for like infinite wishes. <laughs> uh, uh, that, um, it's Monday morning. I'm not very creative right now. I mean, for sure, I'd want a castle with a unicorn. 
maybe like personal concerts by Bruce Springsteen and like Prince coming back from the dead. Uh, like a band, like just yesterday I saw last night, very excited. A band I love has just come back from the dead. Oasis are reforming. Evidently, it's not confirmed yet. <laughs> they're going to reform and they're going to play like 10 gigs next year is what the rumor mill is saying. So I'm rubbing that genie lamp as hard as I can. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, I've taken, I've taken something big sidebar, but uh, okay. like Noel and Liam, please get back together. Um, let's come back to Ian Cassell's dot picking skills. The third one I think is really interesting. Uh, and I think this is one with greatest respect is a skill that uh, you're a, you're still rather a novice at and you need some, some practice of. And this skill is buying or sizing your conviction basically making sure that your exposure to a thesis, to a stock, like how much have you got in your portfolio broadly aligns with like your conviction levels, the risk, the other stuff in your portfolio, you want to manage some diversification, things like that. You do want to have enough exposure that you do get the benefit when your thesis plays out, but also you don't want to be so overexposed to something that's so high risk or have like much of your portfolio perhaps dependent on a single risk that could take them out that like a, a bad decision or just bad luck on behalf of the company could like impact your lifestyle. Absolutely. I agree with everything you said. This is risk management stuff, which by the way, I'm planning on doing some very deep dives about because this is one of the most interesting phenomena, both in terms of psychology and emotional control. It's so interesting when, you know, you said this is what I'm still a novice about. I, it's how, how I want to phrase it this way. There were years in which I was not a novice in this category. And then something, so it's almost like, it's not that I don't know the principles, right? I think the pitfall is more like, it has more to do with that psychological component where things got fuzzy because of the amount of research I I did. It's definitely something to watch and it changes all the time. Like something, something could be, high risk in your portfolio and over time it could become low risk so you can get develop more exposure to it or maybe the company missteps and it becomes higher risk in some way like something's gone wrong they lose a key customer or supply chain failure or something so you've got to monitor this stuff ongoing and yeah but it's just it's like the maintenance and the, the housekeeping of your investment portfolio and of your investments it's why you like you gotta do your due diligence and you've got to listen to the quarterly earnings calls and just keep tab on what's happening in the world. Right. And it's important to know everything is relative. Mm. Like you were saying, regarding who you are as an investor, your age, where you are, your income levels, but also everything relative to everything else you have in your portfolio. And uh, maybe a little preview of a future conversation we'll have on this podcast relative to macroeconomic conditions. Because an investment in one time period that is, say, uh, not risky would be much riskier in another set of circumstances. And that obviously, like the weather, always changes. So this is right to use a poker analogy. It's you have to be a successful poker player. You have to adapt your strategy based on who's sitting to the left of you, to the right of you the level of the game you're playing. It's not like, you know, one hand equals this amount bet each and every time. That's what gets you figured out. Yeah. Like some of the guy who's deeply stuck, like in the red, suddenly gets a phone call from his girlfriend for like a third time to say, you got to come home. You know, that guy's going to do something wild any minute, po- be poised and ready to exploit that situation. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I've realized I've taken us almost into the fourth skill because in my rambling, I started talking about Ian's fourth skill, which was, like maintenance, due diligence, continuously monitoring your high conviction holdings. So yeah, I guess we kind of covered that one. Uh, I'll add this, Badger. Remember, these guys are talking about smaller companies, micro cap companies. In one sense, yes, due diligence all the time. But there's you can't say there's something like too much. Like Apple, I mean, in hindsight, right? Apple at this stage and... I mean, yes, keep up with the company, understand it, follow the news, sure. But that's a whole different kind of due diligence that's needed than an evolving story like, say, EOS. The moment I fall asleep on EOS, I might be shit out of luck because, you know, all of a sudden some the major broke and the company's, you know, on life support. Apple ain't going to be on no life support 
probably. So just quantify the amount you need to do based on company life cycle. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. You can definitely get away with like a mega cap, not not checking in with every earnings. But you should do, like I've, I've sort of proceduralized it myself now and it's a bit of a social media thing, but also it's part of my process now. Like I do an annual review for myself sometime. Maybe I try and do it in Q1 every year and I just go through every holding and make sure I'm, you know, I've got the right exposure and I've got it for the right reasons and I'm comfortable with the company and its mission and kind of where it is in the world and what it's doing. And I think that that's an essential, irrespective of how mega your mega cap is. The next skill is selling. And I, I want to share an anecdote about this one. I was asked uh, in uh, analyst interviews that I did way back in my, in my 30s, like, when ought you, ought you sell? And it's a tricky question because obviously there's no, <laughs> it's, it's very complicated. The answer I gave was never. And I think in hindsight, that's in many ways a bad answer because uh, there are so many variables that go into it. And like we even talked about due to valuation reasons and uh, broken theses and problems with management and so forth. However, this is the irony. Even though I think it's a bad answer, had I actually never sold the companies that I invested in, I would have had much more money than I do now. A bit more complex than that though, right? Because you didn't sell those stocks and just stick the money under the bed, right? You reinvested it in some way. So to really answer that question accurately, you got to say, like, I sold those things and they did great, but the things I used the money for and reinvested it in, like, did they do better? That's probably the right way to answer that question. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> so I still go back to the fact that I had Apple early. I had Netflix early. I had NVIDIA early. I had Tesla early. And like, there's something about, you know, like all these years of doing this that, you know, the simplest answer could sometimes be for reasons that might be even illogical or like wrong are still correct in hindsight. So I don't know. Um, the one point I, I would like to underscore is the micro cap club guys saying if the thesis breaks sell because then it's it's like holding on to it's like marrying a stock versus dating it but also if management somehow lies or becomes untrustworthy or some shenanigans happen that's one of these principled things like don't even think twice sell and move on yeah i've done that once in my investing career, Unity, I forget the guy's name, the CEO, just, and I had my misgivings about him when I bought the company and uh, it was a bad buy. Like he was, he wasn't a great CEO. He'd made a mess of his previous role at, at EA and uh, yeah, he led the company in a bad direction. And so I sold for principled reasons related to his poor management style, his poor leadership, poor leadership decisions. I should have made that call much sooner. Well, I should have made that call and not bought the damn stock in the first place. In hindsight, was that a good move or did the stock continue going up? I mean, did it go up? I think it went up, didn't it? After yeah, sure. you sold? I don't, I don't want to look. Don't make me look. <laughs> don't make me look. <laughs> okay. It probably went up. <laughs> but I definitely, I feel happier. Wherever the money went, I feel happier about it being supporting the mission of a much better company than <clears throat> Unity. That's for sure. Ian's sixth skill, which is quite an interesting one. It's uh it's maybe a bigger, broader one, survival, have a mindset of continuous improvement of risk management to endure in the stock market in the long term. I forget exactly the words he used. My buddy Albert had like a really good saying around this. I might have to go and badger him to uh, remind me of the exact terminology. But essentially, like you want to stay in the game. I suppose we can use a poker analogy, right? In a, say, a poker tournament. But the cash game, you blow yourself up, you just get some more money out of your wallet and you buy back in. In a tournament, you, you know, chip in a chair, that's the saying, right? You've got to stay in the game because if you're in the game, you've got like the ability to win the poker tournament still. And to some extent, investing is the same. Like if you blow yourself up and set yourself back decades, then you just haven't got the capital to deploy when you have like a good opportunity come along. I loved when they talked about as you get older, you naturally become more risk averse, hmm. but risk averse Sure, it could be appropriate, but that's not really what we're talking about. Here we're talking about becoming 
better and better investors. And that means needing to recognize that you've become more risk averse than the data suggests. And you ought to, like a beast in the jungle, continue sharpening your claws without getting complacent. And if you do that, then ironically or counterintuitively, right, you sharpen your claws, that actually might also reduce your risk in an unexpected way. So I, I just love these this set of skills because as John Donahue was talking about, it's like something you could develop, you could continue to work on, you could identify. It's like a way to live better, really. Yeah, yeah, they're good. I think there's lots of ways to articulate the skills of an investor. And yeah, we did our own version with the 10 laws of the investing jungle that you can find at wallstreetwildlife.com. But they all kind of circle around the same principles, really. And I, I do like the way Ian's put this together. You know, I just had also the, the thought, and may, I hope this is encouraging for other folks. I started investing when I was 17. So it's now year whatever, 20, geez, if I do the math, 28, is that right? 45, right? So tw- 28 years, my God. And yet, and yet, Having made all the mistakes, I'm still, as Badger loves to point out, a novice in many areas or have had severe setbacks in many areas. So what's preventing me from saying the next 20 years, I'll continue to try to get better and continue to identify the weak points so that by the time I'm 65, you know, it, it's a it's a continuing journey. Don't stop just because you have some arbitrary accomplishments under your cap. Very good. Well, let's, uh, let's move the conversation forwards, Christoph, and we've got a ton to talk about still on today's episode. But before we do, I just want to remind you to give us a like and subscribe if you're enjoying our content, but also drop us a comment. And we had a whole bunch of comments in the last couple of weeks uh, on the YouTube uh, and on the X's. I do want to call out Sarah Parides. Thanks for telling us that you're planning to start investing in Mercado Libre. That's definitely one of my higher conviction stocks. Also, got a couple of Rocket Lab fans uh, there too. Oh, got a good comment on your Coherus discussion last week, Christoph. One of our commenters said if Amgen was smart, they'd buy Coherus, get an approved PD1 and Udenica for the price of the bonds at seven to eight bucks a share. Which we're thinking uh, mostly because there will be antitrust issues. But yeah, a bunch of folks seem to think that Coherus was a good find, uh, including Jason Smith. So yeah, good stuff. And if you're enjoying our content, give us a comment, give us a tweet. You know what, Badger? Uh, uh, you left out all the comments about how uh, the majority of our listeners are uh, Team Monkey and um, <laughs> how they, <laughs> there, there's some selective comment, comment filtering going on from uh, our humble Badger. <laughs> Uh, no, not deliberately. So, Christoph, you were going to tell us about a interesting comment you saw on inflation and capitalism. Yeah, so uh, I'm from Jersey. That makes me a big Bruce Springsteen fan and a big John Stewart fan. I love John Stewart when he talks economics and policy, economic policy data. He's really, really smart and really in tune. I don't know if you heard some of his commentary way back around the great financial crisis. Uh, Google John Stewart versus Jim Cramer around 2008. That was, oh, he tore him so many new ones. And he was so legitimately pissed at the <laughs> shenanigans going, oh my God, it's just some of the best stuff I've ever seen. Anyway, I respect John Stewart's commentary about these things. He was uh, on his podcast responding to claims that Kamala Harris is turning into a communist because she's engaged in price controls. And his commentary was that the media, and this is what John Seward does best, the media are great at spinning things that are not true and, you know, inducing fear and clickbait stuff. Stewart's point was, look, when you have a crisis, including stuff with energy and high inflation, corporations will try to take advantage of the crisis. So everybody agrees that things like price gouging ought to be illegal. And so what Kamala Harris was saying was companies cannot price gouge. 
that is a, a not a, a inflammatory position, and that does not make her a communist, as the media reported, right? And I think it's worth just exp- taking a quick sidebar to explain, like why some commentators were misconstruing her comments in that way. And I saw a, a New York Post headline describing Harris's plan as communism. The thing they're waving are like the Econ 101 textbooks, and they're basically saying. This is price control, which is essentially where like government steps in and dictates to companies how much they can charge for goods and services. Like we have seen many, many times in history, this just doesn't work. Like you're better off letting the market, the free market, figure it out. If a company's charging too much for its products, like a competitor will dive in and steal those margins and undercut them. And you know, people just won't buy stuff. You're better off designing thoughtful incentives, not just telling companies what they can charge. You know, dive back in, back over to you, what it was that Kamala Harris was actually proposing. Right. So she was actually proposing not controlling prices in this evil, nefarious, communist way, but anti-gouging laws, which, as John Stewart points out, quote, every state, including Texas, has anti-gouging laws. And being from... Texas, the land of the free and where, you know, you get to do whatever you want and nobody can say otherwise, the fact that even Texas has these kinds of laws is basically all the proof you need that this is a bipartisan issue. It's logical. It makes sense. So really the the bad guy here is the way that media is spinning what's really a non-issue that everybody agrees on to into some political issue that is divisive. And I think for our listeners, the important point here is that for anybody that doesn't listen to a podcast like ours and, you know, attempts to learn more deeply, go move beyond the surfacey stuff and peel back the onion layers, you might actually get fooled into a wrong view because truly, and this is John Stewart's other main point, the media is paid to kind of synchronize and spew the same nonsense without any real understanding what they're doing. And if you're a normal person and you see the same quote on every single channel you turn to, you actually might reasonably believe that there's some kind of like price control nonsense going on. Uh, Be careful out there, folks. I don't know if that's the moral or just listen to us religiously. One of the two. (laughs) Or, Or like a bunch of other like smart people who actually think about the headlines and what their implications are not just taking stuff at face value. I'm going to try and relate this back to investing, right? Because it's like, you shouldn't listen to other analysts. You shouldn't listen to us and then go and buy Coherus. But we might have given you that idea. You should go and do your primary research, right? Read the source. Go read the 10Q, the 10K, listen to the earnings call and make your own decision. Like you shouldn't form your opinions just by reading like your highly right-wing or highly left-wing newspaper and not soaking up other sources of information, trying to get a balanced view. And if it's a really important topic, like trying to ferret out the original sources, whether they're academia or um, some international source, whoever it might be. And Badger, you, you maybe to close out the, the episode, there's all the like and subscribe stuff that we're asking our listeners of, but at, we're now growing nicely. And I think what comes with growing our subscriber base and our listenership is that the more comments you guys leave, the more it allows us to respond and to fit and to have dialogue and conversation. So it kind of takes a village to get good at this investing thing. So we highly encourage you all as part of your due diligence, say, if a question arises, ask, don't hold back, go on YouTube, ask, go on X, ask, go on Spotify, leave a comment there. And while you're there, you know, help the algorithms make us a little bit more findable. (laughs) <laughs> well said totally yeah. agree and we uh, we do i think we took one listener question a couple of weeks ago and we turned it into a whole episode so we are listening and we are it's making us be thoughtful about our own investments right it's a two-way value street because if you ask tough questions about the stocks that we're talking about maybe you open our eyes to something we hadn't quite considered great another good episode christoph i think we skipped over a couple of topics because we spent so long chatting about ian cassell's great insights so we'll pick those up next week plus There were like 20 things on the docket this week. So this is great. Our long form podcasts are great. 
but also uh, we're now overflowing with things to talk about. If you do want to chat to us, suggest something, have a moan, you can find us on X, it's the best place. I'm at 7 Luke Hallard. And I am at 7 Flying Platypus. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.